When paired with pressure, its poison is paralyzing. It extinguishes the enthusiasm in even the most equipped. Even the disciples, privileged with the opportunity to experience the power of God firsthand, fell victim to broken spirits in the wake of Christ's death. Forced into retreat until Christ decided to reveal himself. But to his fearful followers, Christ showed himself alive after his suffering. The truths revealed of truth infallible, paired with a set of demonstrations that were simply unquestionable, all performed by the same man who stole the keys to the grave, who came simply to save, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, sharing with them the things concerning the kingdom of God, including a comforter who could only come in his absence. The disciples found a new hope in Christ's resurrection, setting them off in every direction with a dauntless determination. This combination of conversation and demonstration restored and amplified the regular rhythms of their heart's boldness. Rooted in the same power that rolled back the stone, conquered the grave, and defeated death. This knowledge changed what was fear for their lives into fearless sacrifice, hearts and minds aligned with the thoughts of the divine, fully aware of the love of the Savior, knowing the weight of the things of the kingdom, refusing to be silenced by anything less than martyrdom. Seized only by the sword, crucifixion, beheading or stabbing, letting nothing stand in the way of their call to spread the freedom of the gospel because... Once the chains of fear fall and you're set free from bondage, nothing can stop you from spreading the knowledge. Not when your boldness is in Christ. His sacrifice already conquered your fear. So take hold of the boldness of Christ. Leave your doubt behind and rise. We're continuing the series entitled 40 Days. 40 days from the resurrection to the ascension of Jesus. Acts 1 and 3 says, in 40 days, Jesus convinced the disciples by substantial proofs. These men at the crucifixion and during the burial were fearful, second-guessing themselves, disillusioned. But the resurrection of Jesus convinced them. And in 40 days... They would go forth later on to preach the gospel around the world. This church is here today because these men, from boldness, they they, they went from vacillating to becoming great victors for the Lord. And every church around the world has has the ability to trace its origin back to what we call the Great Commission of Jesus. Interesting enough, today is Westover's 32nd anniversary. 32 years ago today, we had our very first service. And I can say with, without equivocation, we can trace our origin back to the, the moment Jesus said to the 11, go preach the gospel to the entire world. If you have your Westover app, I invite you to join me or open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to read a portion of scripture called the Great Commission. This commission was given to the 11 after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is going to give the 11 disciples an assignment. The assignment to preach the gospel around the world. And literally we can say, today we can trace our origin back to this this great commission. Matthew chapter 28 verse number 16 and following. It says, the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. Verse 17, when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him. Now, just pause a moment. They went to the mountain that Jesus told them to go. How did they know which mountain? At the resurrection, the women, you remember we preached on it a few weeks ago. They went to the tomb and Jesus said, tell the disciples, I'll meet them in Galilee on the mountain. The disciples went to the place Jesus told them to go, and Jesus shows up. That always happens. If you will do what Jesus says to do, God will always show up in your life. 
And the Bible says in verse 17, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. But notice this, but some doubted. I, I, I've been there. You've been there at times. You believe you worship God. You're in the church. But sometimes you say, God, I, I'm still trying to figure this out. I love you. I, I'll offer worship to the Lord. But they were still trying to sort things out. You know, sometimes belief is not just one big step. It's a process. Some of us, uh, we're, we're growing. You, you, you have less doubts than you did a year ago. God's taken you. God's advanced you in that. You came to worship the Lord, and God wants to solve your doubts and deals, deal with that. Notice verse number 18. Then Jesus came to them. Wait, wait a minute. I, I, I thought... I thought Jesus already came to them, verse 16 and 17. He did. But it says in verse 18, then, then Jesus came to them. What is that saying? Do you know sometimes you can be with God and then all of a sudden God get closer to you? They, they saw Jesus. They worshiped him. And then the scripture says, then Jesus came to them. Many of us, we're, we're in a service. You know what I'm talking about. Reading the Bible, having a worship moment. And you sense God, then all of a sudden, it's like God gets closer to you. All of a sudden, God comes upon you. There is a closer moment God has. And that's what the disciples experience. Let's go back to verse number 18. Now I'm going to pick up a portion. If you have a print Bible like mine, it's in red letter. It's the words of Jesus. We call this the Great Commission. And as I read it, I want you to notice there are four all statements. Four all statements. In fact, that's my focus today. We're going to look at the four alls of the Great Commission. Verse number 18. All authority in heaven and earth has been given me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything. One version says, teaching them to obey all things. The NIV says everything. One version says all things. Last sentence of that, verse number 20. And surely I am with you all ways. The four alls of the Great Commission. And on this anniversary Sunday, I want to remind us. As a church and every believer, every Christ follower, about the Great Commission. It wasn't to the 11, it's to every Christ follower. And we have four alls that apply to every one of us. Let's look at them real quickly. The first one, he says all authority. In other words, all authority comes from Jesus. Jesus would say, all authority has been given to me. And we need to remind ourselves, all authority comes from Jesus. May I say the name of Jesus provides access for us? It's our password. It's the authority by which we do everything. The assemblies of God don't have the authority. I don't have the authority. Jesus has the authority. All authority comes through Jesus. Jesus provides that for every one of us. My grandfather, when he was alive, before he retired... He worked for American Airlines for several decades. He retired from American Airlines. And at that particular time, they had a policy that if you had so much tenure with the American Airlines, you could get uh, tickets, uh, flight tickets, and you could give them to your children or your grandchildren. My grandfather gave me a free flight on American Airlines. And that was the one and only time I flew first class. Yes, I was in first class. I've always wondered what happens behind that curtain up there. I've always wondered. So I was in first class. I sat down, never been in first class before, so I'm trying to act like I know what's going on here. And can I tell you, in first class, in first class, you get orange juice in a real glass. Not that little plastic thing. You get orange juice in a real glass. Now, my flight was from San Antonio to Dallas. Only an hour. <laughs> Only an hour. But I, for one hour, for one hour, I was in first class. They gave me my orange juice in a glass, and I'm looking for a cup holder. And the guy next to me, he said, here, let me help you. So he pulls out this little drawer that comes. I didn't know. He knew I was not a first class flyer. So I set my orange juice there. And then when the flight arrived, 
and my hour first class was over, I was the first one off the plane. First class. But here it is. I was not on first, in first class because I had platinum status. No. I wasn't in first class because I paid the fee. No. I wasn't in first class because I could afford it. No. I was in first class because somebody else had paid the fee. Somebody else had earned the right. Somebody else gave me authority, gave me access there. I'm here to say, some of us, some of us in the kingdom, you're flying coach, and God is saying, come up to first class. I can do something with you. How do I get there? The name of Jesus gives us access. The name of Jesus provides us the ability to do that. The name of Jesus makes a difference. Some of us, were holding on to junk. We're holding on to debris. We're holding on to family dysfunction. We're holding on to some junk in our life. And the name of Jesus can get you out of that area and bring you to freedom and bring you to life. The name of Jesus provides access. And Jesus says in this commission to the 11, when you go around the world, some of you are going to go to India. Some are going to go to Europe. Some are going to go here and there. But, but then take the name of Jesus with you wherever you go because the name of Jesus provides that access to you. you. You see, we should demonstrate what Jesus has delegated. We should demonstrate what he delegates. God has delegated to us the authority to live an overcoming, making great life. God has given us the ability to rise above the issues, the vicissitudes, the struggles, the headaches of life. And it's found in the name of Jesus. I want you to know today, Jesus has staying power. Jesus has staying power. Now, Toys R Us, that name is going by the way. Have you heard? Toys R Us, it's going to be no more. Oh, it was here. Many of us used to Christmas shop there, but it's going by the way. What are some other things that have come and gone? Any of you remember Montgomery Wards? <laughs> you ever remember? Meg Denise and I, Denise and I bought a Washing machine, we used to call it Monkey Wars. Anybody else remember that? Remember that phrase? Monkey Wars, Montgomery Wars. It is no more. Fads come and fads go. Remember in the late 70s, early 80s, everybody had to have a waterbed? You remember? The waterbed outlet. You remember all those infomercials? They would come into your bedroom and they would build a fence in your bedroom. Then they had a 2,000 gallon baggie they would fill with water. Now we never had one. I was afraid Denise and I might drift apart so we never got one. <laughs> but a, a water bed, I mean that, that was the vote. Yeah, you, you were nobody, you didn't have a water bed. Fads come and fads go. But I can say 2,000 years later you can call on the name of Jesus. It works. The name of Jesus is relevant. The name of Jesus still has power today. This church is 32 years old today. Let me take you back about, about 30 years ago. 30 years ago, we were trying to buy our first piece of property and build our first building. It's the three acres that the student center is on. The student center was originally our first auditorium. And we had a small congregation. We had building funds. I had people that gave vacation money to the building fund. I had people that had garage sales and said, I'm going to give everything to the building fund. There are some people gave income tax refunds to the building fund. And we accumulated about $100,000. But we needed $500,000. To, to buy the property and build our first building. We had about 100000 so I put together a loan package. And I was going to go to a bank, and somebody told, told me that here in San Antonio, there's a bank that, that, that deals, does a lot of church loans and will work with churches. National Bank of Commerce, NBC. So I went to National Bank of Commerce, NBC. I walked in, made an appointment, walked into the office and sat down with the assistant. I don't know how many assistants he was, but here's assistants or something. And I sit down with him and I gave him our loan package. And I told him, we want to build a church building in northwest San Antonio. We want to buy this piece of property. He said, I'll look at it and uh, just call me in a week or so. So I called him in about a week and a half. He said, we're still looking at the loan package. 
So I waited about another week, 10 days, and I called him back. He said, we're still looking at the loan package. So I waited about another week or so, and I called him back, and he said, well, Pastor, I just, I guess I just need to tell you, we cannot lend you money. We just can't do it. I've looked at your loan package. I've looked how many people you got, how much money you got, how long you've been in existence, just a couple of years. He said, he said, disrespectfully, he said, you guys aren't that stable. He said, we can't lend you $500,000. You're just not strong enough for that. 30 years later, the church is here. NBC Bank went bankrupt. <laughs> NBC Bank went insolvent. They went up. They had FDIC backing and they still went under. We didn't have FDIC backing. We had the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus was sufficient. We believed in Jesus. We trusted Jesus. And Jesus made it happen. And 32 years later, we celebrate all that God is doing. Jesus said, all power, all authority comes from Jesus. Number two, I share with us, all people matter but to God. All people matter to God. It says there in verse number 19, go to all nations. All nations, all people matter to God. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves all the children of the world. Now, sometimes you get people that, prejudice let me just tell you revelation chapter 5 6 through 11 john has a vision of heaven he's seeing into heaven and here's what he said he said i look into heaven and i see people of every nation tongue and tribe he recognizes them they're in heaven what does that tell us here's what it says to my hispanic brethren in heaven you're still hispanic Gloria a Dios. <laughs> My African-American brothers and sisters, in heaven, you're still black. Yes. That's what the scripture said. He recognized them. They're of every nation, tribe, and tongue. If you don't like people different from you, you're not going to like heaven. Because that's how heaven is going to be. Now, it is interesting to tell that I see in Scripture, he didn't say the young and old in heaven were all 30 years of age. Amen. 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 No Botox in heaven. Amen. No Grecian formula in heaven. I would tell you what, we're going to have glorified bodies in heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. God cares about all people. Can I share with you what we've done in 32 years? Every time a child comes to Christ, we, we acknowledge it every time a student in a camp or a service comes to Christ. We, we acknowledge it. We make note of that. Every time an adult in a conference, a service, or men's conference, whatever the case, they make a commitment to Christ, we acknowledge that. We make sure that we, we, we count that over 32 years. Here's what we've done to the glory of God, to the glory of God, because all people matter to God. In 32 years, we are... Right at now, we have won 20,491 people to Jesus. In our altars, in our service, at a Westover service, 20,491 people have said, I'm going to follow Jesus. We have baptized in water 3,419 people to the glory of God. All people matter to God. And I want to share with you, and I think it's a great praise report, this year, every day this year, every day this year because you gave one offering last year, and our one day to feed the world offering, in one offering, one day, you gave an offering. And every day this year, there are 1,307 children being fed in third world countries. Today. 1,307 children will sit down to a table and they're going to get meals fed to them today. In third world countries where there are no food pantries, 
There's no Wicca program. There's no food stamps. In third world countries, that if the body of Christ doesn't respond, these kids have nothing. And we're feeding 1,307 children every day. Why? Because all people matter to God. In January of this year, I took a team with me to Kenya, Africa. We flew into Africa. We were in the city of Nairobi for a while. Our team was with us. We were there. We were greeting and meeting the children. We took the children gifts. We took the children candy. Can I tell you? Can I tell you? Our kids are so spoiled today. I've watched my grandkids and turn up their nose because they didn't get the right toy in a Happy Meal. And I've handed candy to kids that have never had a piece of candy in their life at age four, five, or six. And we'll have the first, what they call sweetie. They call it a sweetie. The first piece of candy they've ever had. We would distribute candy. Then we went to a place in Nairobi, Kenya, where you folks built a school. There was an area that we built a school for so children could have an education. It was not that if we didn't build a school, they would get public education. If we didn't build a school, they would get no education. These kids would have no education whatsoever. And we went there, and you, you raised, we raised the money, and you paid for it. We built a school there. And I had the privilege of dedicating that, and the children were in service and singing. And it was such a, such a lovely moment and such a lovely experience. And then we went to one place where One Child Matters partners with the school. This is a school that, that educates children who live in the ghetto. The kids come with their little uniforms. They come with a backpack. Every child is provided a backpack. There was some 300 kids probably there, and they were singing to us, and we were watching them, and they were doing dance moves, and some of us went up there, and we walked and held the hands of the children as they were singing. They were so glad to see us. They're right outside of the slum area. When we were walking, we were walking down a dirt and path, and there was raw sewage flowing in the gutter right next to us. We were there as the children were singing. You could smell the stench of raw sewer all about us because those kids live in that, in that slum area where there is no sewage. There is, there's nothing for those kids. And if those kids don't get an education, they grow up to be criminals or prostitutes. And we're reaching in there and rescuing kids from that. Why? Because God thinks Everybody matters. He said, preach the gospel to all nations. That's why we do what we do. All people matter to God. And you're making a difference. In fact, as we close the service in just a little bit, I'm going to give you an opportunity on our 32nd anniversary to help feed some children in a special offering. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. But let's go to the third all statement. The third all statement Jesus gave us, it's in verse number 20. He says, teach them to obey everything. And one version says to obey all things. And what does it tell us is all of God's teachings are important. All of God's teachings are important. Not some of them. All. All of God's teachings are important. Phrases not found in the Bible. Phrases not found in the Bible. You will not find this phrase in the Bible at your convenience. You will not find in the Bible, the customer is always right. You will not find in the Bible, better late than never. You will not find in the Bible the phrase, to each their own. We quote it like verses and we believe it and practice it like doctrine. But the Bible doesn't teach it. And we're in a culture today where everybody does what they want. And there is a word that is infecting the American church. There's a word that is impacting how we believe and how we live today. It's the word enough. Enough. We will share God's word, teach God's word, read God's word. And people say, that's enough. Almost like you're, you're at a banquet and you've had enough. No, no more for me. And like we have the privilege to say, I've had enough. In fact, pastor, you say it any stronger and you say it any more. Can I tell you what? I'll just go somewhere else. Yes. Church people that if the pastor preaches it just a little too stern, a little too frank, a little too obvious one weekend, they will just, they'll just not show up for three or four weeks. Yeah. Why? Because we want to believe a few things. 
And this mandate says we have to obey everything. Everything. The Bible's not a menu. I can't walk through it and just pick out the things I want. I can't say that's enough, God. That's just, I'm satisfied. Don't go anymore. I, that's as far as you can go with me because I worked it out with God. God and I have this arrangement. He doesn't, he doesn't require me to obey everything. He just lets me pick the things I want to obey. And the word enough has taken the American church where we have undiscipled disciples. Undiscipled disciples. We have people that believe, but they don't believe everything. People that love Jesus, but don't follow Jesus. They said to Jesus, that's, that's just enough for me. I got enough from God already, and I'll just take it at my ability to absorb it. But there is one word that God says to us, and it's the word yet. Yet. You say, I don't believe it all yet. And God and the Holy Spirit work in our life to bring us to a point of complete obedience. You see, blessing comes at the speed of obedience in our life. The blessings from God come at the speed of my obedience to God. Some people say, I can't do it. And God is saying, yet. I will never make it. God says, yet. I will never see it happen in my lifetime. Yet, for every negative thing, for every time you give an excuse, every time you look at your life and you feel inadequate, every time you say, I can't do it, God's saying yet. For you see, God wants to work in our life. Jesus is not speaking a demanding you ought. Jesus is giving an empowering you can. You can. You can be different. Your home can be different. Your life can be different. Your story can be different. God can rescue. God can change. God can change the storyline of my life and your life. Yes, he can. Because this book says it. And we are going to obey everything God says. And fourth, fourth, right before I share with you the way that you can help us feed some hungry children. The fourth all is to know that God is with us always. God is with us always. That was the promise of Jesus, verse number 20. I am with you always. That's the unequivocal promise. That's the, that's the promise that's never amended. That's the promise God never reneges on. That's the promise God never takes away. Every one of us, every position, every pathway in life, can I tell you, God will be with you. He'll be with you when you know what to do. God will be with you when you don't know what to do. God will be with you when your heart is full of joy. God will be with you when your heart is broken. God will be with you when family is good. And God will be with you when there's tears in your eyes and your heart aches. He's going to be with you to the end. You see, that's the promise. We have the name of Jesus but we have the presence of Jesus as well. Wow, you can't go wrong with that. The promise of God's presence will take you all the way. I want to share something with you. I've shared a portion of this story, but there's a portion of this story I have not told you, and it concerns my mother. It was March of 2016. Mom went to heaven. There is so much of who I am today. I can trace my spiritual roots, and my, my, my spiritual experience to my mom. My mom took us three boys to church. My, my dad didn't go, unfortunately. But my mom took us, every mother, every parent, you take your kids to church. And the other spouse is not faithful, doesn't support you. You don't give up. I'm a product of a mom like that. Mom took us to church. I, I learned to pray by mom. I can remember. I can remember as a kid, God would get the three of mom would get the three of us around together and we would kneel by the bed and mom would usually have each one of us take turns praying. So we would do the night prayer. Pray out loud. It was from mom. I learned to appreciate the Bible. 
I have images in my memory of crawling in the bed with mom and we'd get around her and she had a picked old Bible and she would read the Bible and she would turn the page and I always wanted to get real close to mom because I always wanted to see the pictures and the picked old Bible that came from mom. Mom taught me to tithe. There's so much of my spiritual experience comes from my mother. She took me to Sunday school. She took me to church. She signed me up for vacation Bible school. She paid for the youth camp for me to go to where I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. So much of what I am, I have to credit and say, Mom, you began that good work in me. And then my dad passed away. Mom's in the nursing home, had been for a few years. And I learned something. Dad would go to the nursing home and he would, he would recount the family stories to my mother. I remember sitting in the nursing home room and he would say, oh, you remember and you remember. And dad was telling all the stories and I looked now what dad was doing. He was keeping mom's memory alive. He was, he was trying to hold on to mom. My dad passed away and within just a few months, mom's memory was gone. Her memory was gone. The last year and a half, she didn't know who I was. She fell and broke her hip. I went for the surgery, and then that began a series of her going downhill. And that last several months, and particularly that last six or eight weeks, I would preach on the weekends, and I would fly out because I wanted to go be with mom and spend as much time as I could with mom. But her memory was gone. I would show her pictures of me and my brother said, do you know who they are? And she would shake her head, no, no, but they, they look like nice people. I asked her one day, she's in the nursing home, I said, mom, do you know who I am? She said, yes, you're, you're my daddy, aren't you? Mom's memory was gone. Then all of a sudden, mom took a turn and they told us it was just going to be weeks. Finally, they told us it's probably within the next 10 days. So I was doing a vigil by her bed as much time as I could spend there. I wanted to spend with mom. I had one prayer. There's one prayer I prayed. God, before she goes, just let her come out of the fog of Alzheimer's one more time I just want to say goodbye to her there's so much of what I am mama you did and I just wanted mama to know I was there and I wanted to just one last time I wanted to say goodbye to mama and God gave me that moment God gave me that moment I was sitting by her bed. Denise had come and gone. Brother Ken had gone. And I said, no, I just got to be with Mama. And the moment came, I was in the room with her all alone. She looked at me. And she asked me the question, how is the church doing? She recognized me. I, I had her for just a moment. Mama was there. I didn't know how long that moment would last, so I told my mom, it's great. Mom, the people have come to Jesus. Hundreds and hundreds of people come on the weekends and worship Jesus because of what you've done. And her last three words that she spoke before she went back into the fog of Alzheimer's and she never came back again, she said, And then mom was gone. She never knew anything ever again. She never recognized me again. I'm here to tell you, God will go with you to the end. God will go with you to the end. He will never jump out. He'll never walk away. God will never give up. He'll go with you all the way. And there's something that just that just encourages my heart. There's something that means so much to me. My mom's last word, Westover, she asked about you. 
She asked how you were doing. And that just encourages my heart. Encourages my spirit. And I want you to know he's promised he'll go all the way. God's not going to fail you. And some of us feel like we're about at that point. And I tell you, you may not see Jesus, but he sees you. And he's going to come even closer to you. That's what it said to the disciples. They saw it, but then he came to them. And he's just going to show up at the right time in your life. And I thank God for that. I thank God for that. Westover, on this 32nd anniversary of this church, I'm going to invite you to join me in a project. When I was in Africa in January, I got on a small flight about an hour and 15 minutes away, got off the plane, we got in a van, we drove about 30 minutes down a paved road, and then we lost pavement and we began to drive and dirt roads back into the bush area, back into the wilderness area. And we began to go where there, there's no electricity, there's no running water, there's, there's no civilization. And one child matters has these schools that are just dotted out there where the kids are, out there where the people just live in the most dire situation. And when we were there, I walked in. And they were about to feed the kids in the school. One school has 200 kids, over 200 kids in the school. And I watched them as they were cooking and preparing a meal. And here are pictures I took. This is their kitchen. And these beautiful ladies are preparing. They bring in the firewood. They stack up a few stones. They have one pan. And they're cooking for over 200 kids. Do you know what that means? That means they start early in the morning and they cook and cook and cook to have the meal ready for them by lunch because they just have one little pan and they're just cooking on an open fire in kind of a storage room that you wouldn't even put your dog in. And I asked the one child matter, what would it take for us to build a kitchen so these kids could have warm meals? They're making the meals early that morning. These kids never get a warm meal. These kids have never had a happy meal. They, they've, they've never played with an electronic device. They, they've had never had a new toy. They've never gone to the movie. There's so much they've never had. And I was thinking, we could give these kids warm meals. In the winter, just be able to come and have a warm meal, the difference it could make. He said, we, we can do it. We can do it. It's $24,000, and we can build a kitchen here. And I said, then sign me up for two of them at both of these schools. My church, I haven't talked to them yet, but I think they would be pleased to build a kitchen here so these kids can have warm meals. What do they do? Oh, I've been to some of the kitchens. We built some before. It's a nice big building with tin roof. It's out of the weather. They still cook by wood because there is no electricity and there's no propane or natural gas there. They still cook by wood, but they build this long counter. And in the counter, they, in the back side, they put the firewood in and they have stainless steel pots, literally this big around, this deep. And they cook rice and beans and different things in there, stews and so forth. And it looks like a, a boat oar they stir it with. They stir it with. I've been there. They give the kids a little plastic bowl. They take a ladle and they bring it out. And the kids get a warm meal and a piece of bread. Is it too much to ask for God's kids to have a warm meal? I don't believe you would disagree with me on that. These kids have nothing nothing some barefoot but I thought you know what we can do we can give those kids warm meals so I signed us up for two kitchens and I want to invite you to help me today let's build a couple kitchens so kids you won't meet till you get to heaven and the difference is, if they'll come to school, guess what? They teach them about Jesus. If they got a warm meal, those kids will show up. 
those kids will show up for school. We can change their lives by just giving them a warm meal. This offering, 100% is going to be dedicated to building two kitchens in Kenya, Africa. I'm going to ask our ushering team to come forward. And giving, as Denise said earlier, comes from the heart. If you want to give, give. You say, I don't want to, then that's fine. You, you do what your heart says to do. You say, what, what should I give? Wh whatever you give is going to be enough. Whatever you give. How about for 32 years, a dollar for every year? That sounds like a good number, doesn't it? Say, no, it's not. Well, then $10 for each year. That would be a better number for you. No, <laughs> I just, I'm in jest. This offering, we're just going to build kitchens. So kids in third world country can have a warm meal. If you're giving check or cash, retrieve one of the giving envelopes. There's a category there called missions. Everything you give in this offering is designated missions. If you're going to give online, go to the category of missions and designated admissions. If you're giving text to give, whatever number you put in, just put the word missions. It doesn't buy missions tickets for us to go to a ball game. It's missions to buy and build a kitchen in Africa. Whatever you want to give, I'm just going to invite you. How about it? How about let's, let's celebrate our 32nd anniversary by giving it away to others. I think that would please the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of coming before you on our 32nd anniversary. You have been so good to this church. You've blessed us. But today, it's not about us. It's about people. It's about kids that Jesus loves and cares for. It's about the beautiful children of Kenya, Africa. And I thank you, God, for the generosity of your people that are going to share with us and have a part. Do something so those without can have something. Receive this offering with our worship and our appreciation. And on this day, God, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives and all that you've done for Westover. In Jesus' name, amen. While the ushers receive this offering, can I just for a moment, in behalf of Denise and I, can I thank you for allowing us to be your pastor for 32 years? 32 years, and God's been so good. And when we started Westover 32 years ago, Denise and I had a three-year-old and a two-month-old. Our girls grew up here, and you were so gracious and so kind. You included us in your family. You just wrapped your heart and your arms around us. Can I tell you, you've been so loving. You've, you've overlooked our faults. You, you've overlooked our shortcomings and just loved us. And what a wonderful privilege it is to say we're the pastors of this great church. And I wanted to say that from the the bottom of our heart. I, I want to also say, don't do anything for us. Don't, 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 don't do anything for us. You want to do something? You help build this kitchen. But don't do anything for us. Because nothing would do our heart more good, more joy, than to see these kids in Africa taken care of. Again, we love you, and we so appreciate all that you do. And that comes from the bottom of our heart would you stand together with me thank you Westover for being here go in the love of Jesus